Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that introduction. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished guests, delegates, um, I think this is <clears throat> it's a subject of great interest to me. It's something that I've been following for a long time. It is development of fighter aircraft, and uh, and why this um, category of aircraft is uh, so successful, um, why it's been so enduring, um, despite very often people saying that the fighter aircraft is obsolete. Uh, a year after I was born in 1957, in, in 1957 a British Defence White Paper um, concluded that the um, English Electric Lightning would actually be the last manned fighter in service of the RAF. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, more recently, people have said the fighter is on the way to being replaced by unmanned aircraft. I'm not sure that's going to happen either, at least not for a long time. And may I first say that um, my presentation this afternoon is dedicated to the memory of Harry Hilliker, designer of the F-16, who sadly passed away uh, this weekend. Um, Harry was a great guy, a tremendously talented designer, and his influence over the modern fighter, through the influence that he had over shaping the F-16, was just enormous. So, what I'm going to run through briefly is some very basics, uh, a sort of reassessment of some basics about why we have fighters, um, uh, what they do, how they do it. Um, I'm going to look in a little bit of detail at stealth, because I think there's a lot of um, misunderstanding of what stealth is and what it means. I'm going to look at the direction that fighter development is, in my view, likely to go in the next few years. The case of fighters is based on the fact they do things for a military commander. They generate military options that are unique. Um, because they can protect themselves, they can go in without escort. They can go into a hostile environment. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, they go in with a pair of eyes on board to accountably identify the good guys and the bad guys and place ordnance very close to the latter. Nothing else can do this. Nothing else can move that far and still put eyes on target. And they have other, they have other talents as well. They can go a long distance and launch, um, and, actually, um, and actually launch a precision guided weapon um, that will go even further. They can do reconnaissance. They're self-escorting. Um, many other things can achieve effects from great range. Or well, they can do reconnaissance, but they need support to do it. Or well, they can't do it if there's any kind of opposition in the air. So for that reason, fighter aircraft are unique in what they do. Fighter aircraft are not cheap. There's always a complaint, I think, every time that, uh, and we heard, you know, we've heard aspects of this throughout this uh, seminar, that the aircraft are expensive. Um, and they are, but at the same time, I think paradoxically, they can also be affordable. And the reason is that they're among the longest serving weapon systems out there. And people tend not to realize this. But um, this is a picture of a couple of Aegis cruisers. Um, half billion dollar ships in their day, um, launched, christened in the 1980s, commissioned in the 1980s, um, and retired after 18 years, um, simply because the cost of maintaining them and the cost of upgrading them was so high. Meanwhile, fighters like this F-16A here, um, in service with the Netherlands Air Force, are 20 years old and counting, and are still very viable weapon systems and will remain so for some time to come. Um, let's deal with the question of no more manned fighters after JSF. Um, UCAVs are on the way. They're in fact here, um, not only in black programs, um, but also in the form of aircraft like the Reaper, a manned combat air vehicle, although it's not doesn't have jet performance. 
Um, so far, those aircraft are only so, will only survive, again, if there isn't any air opposition, if there isn't even any serious air defense from the ground. Um, the fast jet versions are underway. But they can't do close air support. I don't think they're going to be doing close air support for a long time to come. Um, they can do persistent deep strike. Um, they can't put eyes on target. Um, if you want to confirm the identity of a target, or the UCAV, you're going to have to rely on a high capacity data link. And we just heard about bandwidth and how little there is. And also, that bandwidth is subject to people interfering with it in many different ways. So given we need them, what do they do? Um, the point is, I think, to be made from this slide, and I think we can read it, easily read it, but the point is that today's priority mission, I mean, today's priority mission for many air forces if, is if your aircraft can't do close air support, it's a paperweight. And that's what everybody's concerned about right now. But that doesn't mean that tomorrow or the day after, the, the important mission is going to, isn't going to be homeland defense again. Did we think we were going to see um, bears and blackjacks coming down through across the North Atlantic again? Um, did the US Air Force even remotely think that they would be flying air defense missions over the United States before 9-11? Clearly not. Nobody really thought about that. So again, the characteristics of mobility, survivability, and durability um, are very important. I just want to go into detail about some of those. Some very basic fighter requirements. One is survivability. If it's not survivable, if it needs an escort to go somewhere where the um, locals are not friendly, it's not a fighter. It's just an, it's another target. Or alternatively, it's a bomber that needs it, that, that requires es escort. It's got to be affordable. And by affordable, um, it's got to be affordable without crowding out other necessities of national defense. Losing a fighter should not be losing a national asset. Losing a single fighter should never be like uh, the shock to the system, for example, that the Royal Navy, the UK suffered when the Royal Navy lost warships in the Falklands. Um, so even smaller nations um, want a significant force of aircraft. You need enough aircraft to be able to deploy them and sustain them at the same time. One of the lessons of the current campaigns is that for every aircraft permanently stationed in the combat area, there are possibly two, maybe more, aircraft undergoing maintenance, training crews, regenerating tactics back at home. Um, it's got to be affordable alongside many other aviation defense requirements and many other national defense requirements. So the fact is that if you can't afford it, it's not effective. You can talk about cost effective all you want. You can talk about building a, you know, building a fleet of uh, highly, a small fleet of highly effective aircraft all you want. Um, but um, if you simply can't afford it, and you can't, or you can't afford it while still paying for your other defense necessities, then the aircraft isn't effective because it's no use. You can't, you can't buy it. So what makes it affordable? is what is versatile. It can do a lot of things for you. It covers a lot of those defense needs. It's a, that's to say, it's adaptable across missions. As those needs change, it is also adaptable. It is adaptable through life. So versatility, adaptability, is a complete key to fighter development because it makes the aircraft relevant long term. It means that the aircraft you buy today will in 20 years um, still be right for your military missions because if your missions have changed, you have changed the aircraft. Um, this in turn supports long-term production. And again, I think remembering Harry Hilliker, that's the first, F, well, first YF-16, um, fairly similar in its basic lines to the other aircraft you see there, which is the F-16 IN as offered to India. 
Um, but doing a completely different job um, and with a very, very different set of capabilities. But nonetheless, the F-16IN is maintained, would be maintained and supported and upgraded, assuming you buy it, um, alongside older F-16s um, of earlier types. So the versatility is the key to long-term production, and that in turn is the key to long-term and affordable development and, and support. Now, there are standard things. I'm, I think any fighter, and I think we saw a little bit of this in the uh, Sukhoi presentation this morning, um, uh, any fighter uh, can almost be defined by some of these, of these qualities. Um, they, they have over the years been bigger, smaller, faster, more agile, less agile. There's always a trade-off, and there's always a trade-off within, within an affordability constraint of some kind or another. But essentially, the fighter will remain a fairly high-performance aircraft because that is great help to its mobility, a great help to its survivability, and those are essential qualities for the aircraft. But let's dig in to survivability a little bit because this is where we get into a lot of concepts which are often misunderstood and sometimes, quite frankly, deliberately misinterpreted um, in the interest of selling aeroplanes. Not that marketing people would ever deliberately misinterpret anything, as we know. Um, the elements of survivability have always been constant. Um, with speed, altitude, agility, to stay out of the opponent's way. Um, also, to give you the ability in an air-to-air -air, uh, engagement, it gives you control over the engagement. To some extent, it does in terms of um, in, in terms of, uh, uh, of, of, of defeating a surface-to-air missile threat as well. It's the ability to choose to disengage if the circumstances are against you. Um, vulnerability may be close to a practical limit. There, is, there are things being done on some aircraft to improve their um, uh, survivability against a hit, but there's not much that can be done without increasing the weight of the aircraft. Um, Self-defense, of course, is standard. It's one of the things that fighters do. Um, Standoff weapons are a survivability measure. Um, in fact, it's quite conscious in some European planning, it's quite a conscious decision to use a stealthy standoff missile against the hardest targets rather than trying to make the aircraft stealthy itself. Um, and stealth, to go through this list anyway, but um, uh, stealth or low observables is a way to reduce detectability and is therefore one kind of survivability measure. Now, there's kind of a traditional view of LO stealth technology, um, which has been um, promulgated from the earliest days and to some extent I think reflects the concept of operations of the, uh, of the first stealth aircraft like the F-117 and B-2. Um, that it's a sort of standalone survival measure that essentially on those aircraft um, they survived through stealth alone. They weren't fast, they couldn't run, um, they couldn't evade, and they couldn't shoot back. Um, to a great extent too, they, and, and, to, and they couldn't, neither could they jam the defenses. So this is thrown into a view um, promulgated through a million PowerPoint slides that says that LO is unbeatable, um, that it's the only way to survive against air defenses, um, and that a, quote, first generation fighter doesn't stand a chance, will always be seen, targeted, and shot first by the stealth fighter um, before it has a chance to even um, defend itself. Now, that view is a little bit simplistic, and let me explain. Um, but there are really at least three kinds of stealth technology out there. Um, pretty well everybody now, um, we're talking about uh, Gripen, Eurofighter, Rafale, um, a current generation F-16 or F-18, uh, uses some kind of measure to reduce its, uh, and also the SOPO family, um, uses some kind of measure to reduce its radar cross-section. 
Um, they use coatings on inlets. They use coatings on, in the Sukhoi's case, on the inlet guide vanes. Um, they use coatings on a duct. Uh, they use special materials inside on the canopy or inside the inside the radar. Um, it's fairly narrow band, fairly limited aspect, and it's designed to work um, synergistically with active jamming. One of the great things about um, reducing the signature is that its effect on the burn through range against jamming is really quite dramatic. So if you if, if you apply a certain amount of LO technology to the aircraft, um, the power you need to radiate, the complexity of your jamming task gets much, much simpler. So that's being used by everybody. Now you've got then you've got the sort of F-22, F-35 class um, of LO, um, which operates over a bigger wave band, um, operates all around the aircraft. Um, but it's, it's called a bow tie pattern because the aircraft is much more visible from the side than from the nose or the tail. Um, it's, although it operates over a wider range of wave bands where um, it certainly doesn't cover all of them. It doesn't cover VHF. It doesn't cover um, the very low frequencies. Um, and it's, it's, used, it's used without any kind of active jamming apart from what might be obtained through the forward-facing radar. Now, the third group, which you might call very low observable, and in which you find the B2 and the and some of the UCAV projects now today um, consist of flying wing shapes that are stealthy across all the relevant radio frequency bands um, from all directions, and also a very strongly managed infrared and even visual signature. Um, and those are extremely extremely stealthy vehicles, and they're that way because they don't really have a way of reacting to a threat. Now. I point out, too, um, quite quickly, that um, stealth itself is, uh, LO itself is not free. If you compare the Rafale and Typhoon, you see that the Typhoon is lighter. Um, it is, it still has a bigger wing, which gives it, uh, would ten uh, tend to give it better performance. Um, and it's much more flexible in terms of external carriage. Um, it has, um, um, even even in non-stealthy mode, um, the, the Typhoon has more places to put it, to, to carry stuff on the aircraft than the, than the F-35 does. Um, again, internal fuel and internal weapons are not necessarily an unmixed blessing for a fighter aircraft, although people sometimes talk as if they are. Um, but the thing is, external tanks and external weapons are a bit like staging a rocket. They're a little way of cheating the breakaway range equation um, and uh, giving you uh, extra performance. Um, the internal space all has to be stressed to 9G and 8,000 hours life. It adds a lot of weight. Um, absorbent material adds weight. The antennas and apertures are big and heavy. So. It, again, there is not a free lunch there. Um, and another issue when we talk about net-centric operations is that there is an inherent conflict between a system that is transmitting all the time, as in net-centric operations, or is transmitting on demand, and a system that's trying to remain stealthy. Um, here's one example of another example of LO not being free. In fact. With a full load of external fuel, um, an F-16 will carry more and go further than an F-35. Um, or certainly almost as far. Now, you can argue, well, the F-35 can carry external fuel. Well, in fact, it's rather limited in that regard, because when you start loading that stuff on, not only you are not stealthy, um, but um, the, the performance of the aircraft is close to its maximum. You're close to the maximum that the wing loading will take. You, because, again, of the penalties of carrying internal weapons and fuel. I think there's some way from somebody negating stealth, but people have had a long time to think about how to deal with stealth aircraft, and there's a lot of solutions out there. Some of them include, some of them are very processing heavy, like track before detect, 
which actually is being implemented on the um, Israeli early warning Gulf Stream looks of the show. Um, there's a return to the old uh, VHF and OTH radars um, because those are largely immune to most stealth measures. Um, when you start networking all these systems, so you have a VHF radar, which granted is fairly inaccurate, granted is fairly um, susceptible to jamming, um, but if at least you have a clue to, as to where the adversary is, that's when you turn your high power AESA, like a searchlight beam, onto the spot where you think the aircraft is. So many of these things will improve and improve very fast as networking and um, processing improve. Let me talk quickly about lethality. Um, a lot of the changes to what a fighter aircraft can do in terms of target, targeting its opponents have to do with things that are bolted on the outside, whether, targeting pod, whether they're targeting pods, um, data links, um, or weapons. Um, with some of the targets, some of the conflicts we're looking at right now, as uncertainty rises, um, so you want to carry uh, more and more different types of, uh, of ordnance. And in fact, if you look at this F-15, which is taking off on an operational sortie, it's carrying no fewer than five different kinds of ordnance on board. And so that flexibility becomes essential. We're taking advantage of electronics revolution. I think this is just a spec uh, an example of where we were at when the F-16 entered service a long time ago. Um, obviously, things have moved along a lot. Um, one of the great things, one of the most important things, I think, out there for any fighter is the, avail is the availability of a targeting pod. That's been a revolutionary improvement. Um, it's easily turned into a reconnaissance sensor. It's a vital in element of close air support because it uh, allows you to pick up an uh, imagery that can then be shared with the control of the JTAC on the ground. Um, and as each generation comes out, and it's been a very rapid process, um, the pictures have got better. The lasers have reached out further, they're more accurate, they can geolocate, um, and they're compatible with helmet-mounted displays. AESA itself is more than just a super radar. Um, as it matures, and its price is in the process of crashing, because what happens is, at a certain point, the chips, the transmit modules in an AESA radar start using the same technology as things like cell phone chips. And at that point, AESA becomes dirt cheap. Um, it's also a very effective uh, electronic surveillance measures tool. It's a very effective jammer in its own wave band and can be used for communications. So again, this is um, pouring a lot more information into the cockpit. Electronic warfare has greatly improved. The targeting is now accurate enough, the, the tracking, the location of an emitter is now accurate enough um, to use it for targeting purposes. We will get to the point of specific emitter ID on fighter aircraft fairly soon if we aren't there already. That's the ability to say, not only is that a cube missile system over there, but it's the same one that was there yesterday because each system has its own fingerprint. Um, as the displays get better in the cockpit, the crew can uh, absorb more information. Um, you now also have the ability to record all this stuff on board, and the aircraft becomes a tremendously capable, non-traditional ISR asset. At this point, we do ask, um, is there actually a space for the return of a two-seat aircraft? Um, it seemed at one point that it was going away. F-35 has no two-seat version, F-22 doesn't. Um, but in fact, and, and the Typhoon, I think, even, even today, um, is primarily a two-seater as a training mode, and a, 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 as a training platform. However, I think you're going to see in future more and more aircraft um, you know, return to the two-seat role, at least in some versions, for roles like forward air control, for roles like close air support, where having one person free constantly to concentrate on the target is going to be an enormous advantage. 
Um, and in fact, you see this in fact with the, with the Super Hornet, where most of the Block II aircraft, the most advanced aircraft, are two seaters. So just to conclude, as I'm out of time, the the fighter I think will survive. I think that the classic requirements will still be there for speed, altitude, acceleration, agility, um, because those translate into survivability, mobility, and lethality, and that's what fighters do. Versatility and adaptability are crucial. An aircraft that cannot be adapted or cannot be affordably adapted into different missions is destined for early retirement and an early place in the museum. And longevity equals affordability. If you, you need to have, once you've established that asset in service, you want to keep it there for a long time. But the fighter in future, I think, will be a platform for many technologies beyond what we've discussed now. I think we'll talk about microwave weapons, we'll talk about directed energy weapons, we'll talk about hypersonic missiles. A lot of things will come along and they will be carried by the aircraft of the type that India is in the process of choosing. So I think we're going to see those aircraft endure for a long time to come. I'm sure we'll be back here talking about them. I'll be very glad to come back again and do that. Meanwhile, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the organizers have chosen very right the first paper after lunch. What is it? I mean this because uh, Mr. Sweetman has dealt with some real juicy topics, controversies. Uh, will the fighter aircraft survive? Will you got do all that the all that people think it'll do? Is the no observer really worth the worth the price? And will the two seater return? I think at least four controversies. I don't think we can have more than four questions. <laughs> so anyone who would like to okay, we can kick off first. Please announce your name and identification. Those of you who want to raise a question, please uh, put up your hand. I'll try and, try and catch my hand. That's a, that, uh, I, I think that, that's a very interesting issue. I think I, I think it, it it depends. There are it's 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 not a simple answer. Um, I think for a, it, uh, it's it's a simple answer for a small aircraft. It's a simple answer for a large aircraft. Uh, a small aircraft. I think even um, many people love the F5, but um, it didn't really need to be a twin-engined aircraft. Um, for a large aircraft like the F-15 when it was designed, there was no engine big enough. Um, the, the, it's, it, it, in between, um, I think there's a viable solution if you have um, two fairly high thrust to weight ratio, um, fairly simple, robust, comparatively robust engines, which I think is a solution you see on some of the twins now, um, may be actually preferable to a single very large engine um, because there's a bit of a tendency for engines to lose um, thrust to weight ratio as they gain weight. Um, also, I think one of the things that we've seen very strongly in the development of the JSF um, was that designing the aircraft of, uh, of the aircraft systems so they wrapped around that vast tunnel down the middle of the airplane. Um, turned out to be quite a complicated task. Um, and you then look over as a twin, which has got a nice convenient central keel, protected by the mass of the engines, and you can run all your systems down there. Um, that can look quite attractive. But I think it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's, it's very much a design decision, and perhaps unfortunately for the Indian evaluators, they're right on the cusp where either solution can be made to work. Um, Commander Malik, I have a question regarding the identification of fighter aircraft, the electro optics and the background, uh, especially passive radiations. Well, pa will be the fighter aircraft? Um, passive radiation? Oh, passive detection? Yes. Yeah. I, I think that um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, that one of the technologies, I mean, when I showed the picture of the, uh, of the 1980s cell phone and things like that, um, one of the technologies that has come across, come along very fast in terms of um, uh, driven by electronics um, has been the ability to, uh, to do uh, passive detection of one kind or another. Um, the ability to uh, identify and track a target very quickly um, based on a, a, a single uh, very short pulse of, of signal. Um, the capability of infrared search and track systems, I think, is advanced. Um, as you start combining that with processing and memory, um, which will allow you to say, hey, I see something here. Um, does that mean I should go back and look and see if I saw it 10 seconds ago a little further away and then I can build a track on it? Um, you can start doing things like this now that you know, um, gigabytes of memory um, fit on something this big. So I think that uh, I think we'll see a lot of change, uh, quite a bit of improvement in the ability of passive tracking systems to lock onto things. And again, this will give you another um, uh, another um, almost uh, dimension, another dimension of stealth, because um, does stealth mean passive stealth? Uh, that is to say, the uh, ability to avoid detection, or does it mean the ability to detect without uh, emitting any signals yourself? And I think the answer is it probably is going to mean both. Good afternoon, I am Malay. No, yes, sir, please. With stealth, the stealth uh, capabilities, it can be very, very nice in getting a fighter plane which does not have stealth. I give an example of F-16 and the F-117 that you showed there. Yeah. I don't think that F-16 is a stealth fighter and F-117 is a stealth fighter. Yeah. But still, in number of hours of flight and the sorties and missions, I find that F-117 has been killed more times. So, what I say, I just want to Argument or not, whether stealth is really a good thing. It's not overrated. It's a buzzword for marketing, not really very much useful in the field. I think, I think stealth. I think, I think stealth is a, is, it's it's a valuable attribute, um, and there's and again there are certain requirements for which a stealth solution is clear cut. If you want to. If you want to fly a reconnaissance drone UAV into hostile territory and survive, and ideally you don't even want the other guy to realize he's been imaged, then extreme stealth is the only way to go. Um, if you are dealing in close air support, um, for example, stealth is almost irrelevant. Um, in between, you have to consider whether what degree of stealth you want and how much that costs you in terms of the other attributes that make up that system. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, this is Balkan. Uh, sir? Uh, sir? Uh, yeah. Last question, please. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, uh, sir, can we go back to your 22nd slide? That is three slides back. Three slides back? Yeah. 22nd slide. 22nd slide. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, one more back. No, I think uh, I have not noted the number properly, but uh, the issue is that you have uh, said somewhere in your slides that it has video recording, editing, and transmitting capability. On top of that, it has lower bandwidth requirement compared to UAV. So can you can, can I see a little more detail on that? Uh, you're talking about UAVs. I'm sorry, I didn't catch, quite catch the question. I think. Uh, this is, no, a, this is an excellent, excellent topic for the debate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think we should stop this uh, discussion at this point because we're already overshooting the time. I request you to please uh, interact with the author at the outside. Um, I, uh, it's my pleasure to 
thank Mr. Bill Sweetman for his excellent presentation, which has obviously won a lot of people who are interested in it. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Sweetman, for the excellent presentation. And um, there is a, the organizers are a small memento for you. I would thank you. Please accept it.